that the purpose of this evening's meeting is to um, firstly receive the city's 2019-20 annual report and secondly to provide you all as electors with an opportunity to raise any general business or motions relating to the City of Vincent. And thank you to those who've already provided those in advance in writing. Um, we do have the ability for you to submit. Um, there should be paper around the room or if anyone wants to put forward a motion, please just raise your hand and we'll make sure that you do get a piece of paper to fill out your motion. Um, to speak at the meeting, you do need to be an elector of the City of Vincent. And if you're not an elector of the City of Vincent, you're very welcome to stay and observe. Um, at this meeting, uh, we all have status as electors, including council members. So council members are attending this meeting as electors equally as you are. Um, everyone has the opportunity to vote on each matter, but voting is not compulsory. All decisions at this meeting will be made by a simple majority, meaning that more than 50% of the votes are in favour of the motion. The mover and seconder for all decisions will be recorded in the minutes of the meeting, with votes being recorded simply as carried or lost based on a show of hands. The procedures for tonight's meeting are outlined in full detail on page three of the agenda papers. They are available online and they've been placed around the chamber. If you would like to read those and can't see them in front of you, just let, um, just let us know if you raise your hand. Um, speakers at tonight's meeting will need to come forward to the microphone. We did check with Welga and we do need to keep our masks on at all times, even when speaking into the microphone. That's probably the riskiest element in terms of sharing the microphone tonight. So we have also, um, we will also be placing some hand sanitizer at the microphone if it's not already there, just so that you could perhaps hand sanitize in between each speaker because it's natural to want to um, touch and lean on the lectern when you're speaking. Um, yes, we do ask that you keep your questions and comments respectful and relevant to the business of the City of Vincent, which I'm sure you will um, have no problem with. And if you do wish to move a motion at tonight's meeting, then I would ask that you please um, do fill out your form first Motions will need to be seconded by another elector before they can be debated. And a form to submit your notice of motion, as I said, please do raise your hands if you need one of those. Please note the decisions made at tonight's meeting are not binding on council. Rather, council will consider tonight's decisions at its next practical meeting. And that will depend on the number and nature of motions this evening. Um, it, so depending on the workload for administration, that will be either the 16th of February council meeting or the 23rd of March council meeting. And as part of our proceedings, the first item on the agenda is to go to the annual report. And we do have a brief presentation for you all this evening from the CEO. So that is item, but before we get to that, I'll just go to apologies and um, most importantly, declaration of um, our acknowledgement of country, which is that we always acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Mungar Nation and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Apologies, we do have um, Councillor Fatakis as an apology this evening and uh, Councillor Alex Castle is on a leave of absence. Um, and we will now go to report 3.1, the 2019-20 annual report including the 1920 financial report. So I'll go to you, CEO, for an update. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cole. I was going to just provide a brief overview of the annual report 2019-2020. Uh, it's pleasing to see a full house in the public um, gallery uh, tonight. I think our facial attire is a, a reminder of uh, the key event that impacted our financial year and operations uh, it, starting in March last year. Uh, but we had a full uh, year of delivering on um, council strategic community plan, which was uh, adopted in October, 2018. There was also a council uh, election um, in October, 2019, and we said farewell to uh, two uh, councillors 
former councillor Jimmy Murphy and former councillor Ros Harley, and welcome two new councillors uh, to the city of Vincent being um, councillor Wallace and uh, councillor Smith. Uh, I was also pleased to uh, welcome a new director uh, to the city of Vincent being Virginia Miltrup uh, this time uh, last year. And we also said farewell to the former director, Michael Quirk. Uh, the priority is that the city of Vincent was working towards and all our services, programs and projects revolved around those priorities set out in the strategic community plan, uh, which, I've out, which are outlined on page 11 of the annual report. Uh, the city of Vincent had been impacted by an economic slump uh, during that financial year, and it was a difficult time for a lot of our small businesses and local businesses on our high streets. Uh, we saw some well-known venues close on Beaufort Street, and it was a difficult time for retail in particular, uh, with a slump in uh, the local economy. And we had uh, focused a lot on the support that uh, we could provide as a city of Vincent to our local businesses, including through our place management program. We progressed uh, the top 10 projects during the financial year, uh, being our implementation, adoption and implementation of our sustainable environment strategy uh, with a pathway to achieve zero uh, net emissions within the city of Vincent. Uh, we also progressed planning and budgeting and preparations for the adoption of the food organics and garden organics three bin system. Uh, we progressed the implementation of a public urban space strategy, a 40 kilometer trial uh, speed zone around Hyde Park. We progressed planning for the future of Beattie Park, particularly the future of the grandstand. Uh, we uh, progressed the development of our transport strategy known as the accessible city strategy. Uh, we also uh, planned and designed the Banks Reserve Playground which was opened uh, later last year, uh, as well as a major planning exercise being our Leaderville Activity Centre plan. In terms of our services, uh, we had a big job to um, update and uh, increase the amount of resourcing we put into capital works in terms of asset sustainability, particularly around our engineering and buildings, uh, in terms of road resurfacing, footpath repair, uh, drainage, uh, attending to our car parks, bus shelters, and our parks and reserve lighting. Our parks team continued uh, to maintain a high quality green spaces throughout the city and progress its eco zoning um, program in some parks, as well as upgrades uh, in um, some of the city's parks. We had a busy agenda in waste in terms of preparing for uh, the FOGO third bin um, project, as well as uh, progressing the key actions in uh, the city's waste strategy, uh, particularly around planning around bulk waste, uh, commercial waste, and an active program of uh, waste education. Uh, Beattie Park continued to be a very well used and much loved uh, centre and we were putting uh, into place the preparations for a major uh, upgrade, particularly on the indoor pool area, which we now see is underway. Uh, library, local history and the community centre continue to deliver great services and they're able to reorientate uh, the services to go online during uh, the closures that we experienced. Uh, in March last year with the onset of the global pandemic. Our policy and place team reorientated their efforts around local business support and helping our local businesses uh, shift from uh, in uh, dining to uh, takeaway and other options to uh, keep their businesses alive during uh, the COVID restrictions. And our statutory planning team worked particularly hard uh, throughout this year in order to uh, process our development applications on time and to meet our statutory deadlines. And we've seen a big improvement uh, in the, uh, the speed in which we've been able to process 
uh, development applications, as well as uh, implementing and moving towards an online lodgement system for planning applications. Uh, one team which uh, doesn't usually get a lot of attention uh, became our frontline defence in the city uh, with uh, COVID-19, which is our um, public health built environment and wellbeing team. Our environmental health officers in particular uh, have been critical in terms of the joint state government and local government response. And our environmental health officers uh, provide a huge amount of support to local businesses in terms of understanding and implementing the COVID restrictions that were put into place in March last year. Uh, Rangers uh, were relocated from our depot site in Osborne Park back into the heart of Leederville uh, in uh, adjacent to our library center. Uh, they start, they're a lot more visible on the streets throughout this year, as well as uh, commencing patrols on new uh, electric bicycles, uh, which has greatly helped uh, their visibility. And we also saw a shift from uh, implementation, a shift from enforcement around parking restrictions were, which didn't become, which were less of an issue during the COVID restrictions to a huge focus of uh, the ranges in terms of community safety, addressing issues around homelessness and helping patrol our parks, which became widely used and much loved uh, during um, the restrictions that we saw in place from March last year. Our communications team in particular were very busy uh, making sure that the important messages around um, public health and city services were well understood throughout uh, our community. And our customer service team uh, had to shift to providing uh, its support online and through uh, telephone and uh, web chat services during the year when uh, we ceased a face to face service during the most severe parts of the COVID restrictions. Uh, we had a busy time uh, in terms of governance reforms. Uh, throughout the year, there's a big focus from the state government on local government reform. There have been big changes to the Local Government Act and regulation, uh, some more just recently announced. And uh, our governance team uh, supported the move of council from face-to-face -face, uh, in-person meetings to online meetings. And we've been continuing to use that technology through a combination of Zoom and YouTube, which I think has uh, been able to broaden our reach of council meetings and transparency around council decision-making uh, and help with accessibility for people who do find it difficult to get into a council meeting at 6 p.m. on a Tuesday night. Our financial team uh, had to work around the clock to understand and react to the financial implications of uh, COVID-19 to the city's financial position. Uh, that involved an emergency budget and a very difficult exercise to recalibrate our budget uh, coming into this financial year. Uh, there's also a huge effort around support for our staff um, to enable working from home and safe COVID practices uh, during uh, this period. And our IT system excelled our, our, team, our IT team excelled in supporting staff to the shift to home and remote working, uh, which saw a step change in the city of Vincent's uh, communications and technology. And we've been able to uh, embed those changes uh, to create a much more mobile, flexible and agile workforce and ability to deliver our services across the board. Uh, Mayor, that's a quick overview from all our service areas and the projects. Thank you, CEO. Um, look, I just would like to add from a community perspective, I think that um, we've saw a phenomenal response in terms of the, the support, the community experience, um, spirit, the innovation showed by our local businesses in trying to adapt. Um, the changes came thick and fast in terms of the public health requirements. And I just want to commend the community on the way in which they handled that, responded, did everything that was asked of them, um, and really supported one another. Um, we saw some really lovely um, examples of people responding in different ways and, and Anzac Day really comes to mind as a way of celebrating and, and um, noting days of importance in a different way. 
Uh, we had people go out on their driveways at, the, at dawn to, um, to really commemorate and to be amongst their neighbours. There were some wonderful things. There were people that were, you know, having uh, drinks on their driveways in, in ways to sort of keep socially distant but to keep connected. We had an outpouring of people wanting to volunteer and help and um, we saw a huge support for our local businesses. Um, here we are all masked up, doing the right thing again. And I think it's just a credit to everyone in the community when we go to our local parks, see everyone there doing as we've been asked to do and um, being in a more fortunate position for it. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of the community members for playing a huge part in our success over this year and for being incredibly supportive and just being a fantastic community. It's really a very, very special community to represent and it's a great, great honour for all of us on council. So thank you very much, CEO. We will move on uh, from that. But in terms of this item, we do need a mover and seconder. It can be moved by anyone, doesn't have to be a council member. So I'd like to call for a mover and seconder to adopt the annual report. I'm the only one that can't move and second, so I am relying on you. Thank you. What is your name? Susan Bruton. Thank you very much. Susan has moved the adoption of the annual report. Can I have a seconder, please? Moved by uh, Ron Alexander. Thank you very much. Um, all those in favour? All those against? I declare it carried. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we will now move to general business, and this is the opportunity for all electors to bring forward their motions. We don't have a set order, so it really does come down to whoever would like to come forward first. Um, we just do remind you to please keep your mask on, and if you wouldn't mind hand sanitising, um, that would be absolutely fantastic. So, Ms. Murray, you're very welcome to come first. Mari Slyth, 89 Car Street, West Perth. And do I do the hand sanitising before or after? <laughs> Can't get to work. Okay. Um, now, I wish to um, ask a question but also put a motion as part of the same. Yes, me, Mary, just before you get started, um, do you have a copy of your motion in writing that yes. I could provide okay, to, to Emily? And perhaps, um, do we need that first or can Murray submit that after? Okay, we do need to take a copy, Murray. So perhaps would you mind if, if you could provide that to Emily and she can take a copy and perhaps you could come back and be second? Okay, right. Sorry, Murray, it's just the procedures required. It has to be in writing. Okay, yeah, she can take that one. Oh, that. fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is in relation to Cleaver Precinct Character Attention Area. Please let us know how close Cleaver Precinct Character Attention Area is to getting approval in the City of Vincent 2020-2021 budget. Uh, there are a great number of things now weighing on this action taking place, especially since Florence Street now has a number of character attention category houses currently having for sale signs on them. And of course, there is no way of predicting whether several of new owners may consider developing their property before or while councillor proceeds with the Cleaver Precinct Character Attention Area approval in the budget. It is well known that delays in getting finalisation carried out by council, particularly in the case of character attention heritage categories, can lead ultimately lead to people losing interest and starting to change their minds and or today perhaps needing to sell their houses when needing money, and or again, deciding to sell while the market is good. We Cleaver Precinct Character Attention Area supporters who have worked hard to save our area will be very disappointed and disillusioned if Vincent Council fails to achieve delivering Cleaver Precinct within the boundaries allocated as a character attention area. Accordingly, I wish to move a motion that council recognise the great urgency involved and place Cleaver Precinct Character Attention Area in the 2021 upcoming budget. 
Thank, Thank you. you, Mary. I'll just call on a seconder for your motion. Is there a seconder? Thank you. Go ahead, Mary. Do you wish to speak to it further? No, that's all I'm putting. Okay, so Mary feels you've spoken to her motion already. Does anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Would the seconder like to speak? Does anyone have any comments in relation to this motion? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Looks like it could be close. Um, if you could just leave your hands in the air, we're probably going to have to do a count. Fourteen for, and those against? That is overwhelmingly carried. Thank you, Mari. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, next motion, please. Come forward. Thanks, Mayor. I'm Cam Sinclair, 201 Loftus Street, Leaderville. Um, I've emailed a motion uh, earlier today, um, so I don't know if you've received that yeah, electronic copy. Yes. Got that there? So should I just read the motion and then speak to it? So the uh, yes, if you read the motion and then we'll call on a seconder and then speak to okay, it. That is no actually the, the best way to do it. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, so we call on the City of Vincent Council to reconsider the discontinuation of commercial waste collections for the 2,111 small businesses in our community who rely on it every day and consider either acting as an agent to negotiate the services required by local businesses and reducing rates permanently to reflect the increased costs of doing business in the City of Vincent, or deferring the change by 12 months to explore other service options, such as engaging neighbouring councils to provide commercial waste collections. Thank you, Cam. Is there a second for Cam's motion? Seconded by Dudley Meyer. Um, go ahead. Cool, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, look, it's not been an easy year to, to be in business, uh, to run a small business, particularly in the, in the city of Vincent. Um, as the CEO said, there's been a lot of retail, hospitality businesses that have shut their doors. Um, and, you know, it's, um, it gets difficult with additional costs and reduced foot traffic and everything else that goes on. Um, you know, I've talked, I, I run a small business in the uh, Sterling Street precinct, um, and I've probably talked to a few dozen uh, other small business owners in the area. All of them were genuinely surprised that their commercial rubbish collections were going to be discontinued in June. Uh, it was quite unexpected um, when people received the letter in September and it was a lot of confusion about why that was happening. Um, I just run a small office of five, with five staff, so it's not a major deal um, for me in particular, but, you know, there's rubbish scraps and from lunch and beer bottles on a Friday afternoon, still got to have some way to dispose of that rubbish. Um, but it's not a core part of my business and uh, it's not something that makes sense to need to be an additional cost in our business. Um, next door to me is the camera electronic uh, retail store and they've worked out that it's going to cost them an additional $7,000 a year um, for their rubbish collection, particularly around cartons and cardboard um, disposal and things like that and packaging. Uh, so it's a real cost on small business owners and it's not just a, something, a tax deduction or something that comes off the bottom line. This is take home pay for small business owners. This comes out of our pocket and it reduces the amount of money that we can spend in our community as well. So it actually does have an impact. Um, and, you know, the $520 in the first year just doesn't really, doesn't really cover it, um, particularly when that expense is coming back onto our rates in the following year. So it's not great timing, guys. Uh, I don't know how many of you also run small businesses, but I'm sure if you, you know, if you do that, you'd, you'd understand. But the in increased costs at the moment is not, uh, it's not a great time to do that to us. So we'd really love for you to maybe go back, see if this is something that could be deferred for 12 months and see if there's some other options that you might be able to help us with. Thanks very much. Thank you. Seconder coming forward. Thank you, Dudley Meyer of Highgate. Um, when this was first brought to council, there were five options that were presented that range from no change at all, to the city doing it all by themselves, to dis discontinuing the service and keeping the money. Interestingly, the recommendation from the admin in September was to go with the last option, which was to provide, um, to, to cut out the service, 
keep the money but provide a rebate just for the one year. And the, the report or the attachment to the report said uh, this would allow them to, to build up a reserve of $8.3 million over the following nine years. The obvious, obvious option that was missing from the report was the one of going out and getting a single collector to take over the collection, effectively acting as an agent for 2,100 small businesses in the area. So rather than 2,100 businesses having to negotiate a deal, the city could get economies of scales, they could get consistent collection practices, et cetera, et cetera. As Cam said, it's a real cost to local businesses and it's a real cost that's multiplied by 2,100. The city already has the information they need to go out to a, a tender. They know all the businesses, they know what services each business receives, how many bins they get of each type. So you've already got that information. So it's just a matter of going out to the market and getting a schedule of rates and somehow managing it. It would take some, some effort and it would require some commercial experience, but it would be a lot more efficient than 2,100 businesses doing it on their own. So I think the council should ask the staff to seriously investigate it. And there's a mechanism for the councillors. You could move a rescission motion at the next meeting and start that process. There isn't anything magical about the 1st of July. I was thinking about why pick that, and it's obviously to do with the rates, but you can pay a rebate at any stage. And in fact, the initial proposal last March wanted to discontinue the collection from the 3rd of August, 2020. So July the 1st is not a magical number. So I strongly support uh, Cam's motion that I think he's, he's speaking on behalf of 2,100 businesses in Vincent. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Thank you, Nick Catania from North Perth. I, in support of this, I, I think it's been well put by both speakers, the cost imposition to small businesses who over the last 12 months, of course, have had a, a hard time in, uh, in uh, the COVID uh, situation. But there are other matters uh, that are very important, should be considered by council, and that is the effect of um, private collectors. Already the streets of uh, Vincent around the, the city centres are clogged with cars, uh, where people that work in the, in, the, in the small businesses park on residential streets, they're clogging those streets. Can you imagine if there's 2,111 small business each contracting their own collection and then the number of vehicles that go up and down those streets would further clog the streets and indeed cause uh, environmental concerns. Uh, I, I cannot, uh, cannot uh, implore the council more uh, to reconsider the situation. 2,111 small business 2,111. That was uh, repeated very well. <laughs> okay. I Sorry about the, that. Mr. I thought it was one of the councillors. I think it was, uh, it was an emphasizing your point rather well, but was okay. a technical glitch. I thought it was one of the councillors going to put a calling to order, um, but uh, forgetting I was here 11 years ago. Anyway, I implore the council, I think it should be reconsidered. I think the plight and onus and, and burden on small businesses having to pay uh, for the collection after the first uh, 12 months of getting $520, which is a meagre amount when it costs so much to employ private contractors. The second point I'd like to emphasise is that one of the reasons why Council decided on this was to stop waste going to landfill. Now, you can stop your own collectors uh, when the council collects the waste going to landfill, but you can't stop private contractors that pick up commercial waste going to landfill. In fact, indeed, I have questioned some of the contractors that may be interested in, in picking up um, commercial rubbish, and they wouldn't, uh, uh, they, would, they would go to landfill. And uh, so the council does not achieve one of the ends it wants to achieve, and that is to reduce the amount of waste going to landfill. So there's two reasons. One, the imposition on small business by way of cost, and two, the fact that you won't achieve the end that you want to achieve, that is go, having less waste going to landfill. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Are there any further speakers on this item? Yes, come forward, Mary. I'd just like to endorse the last point that the council has a zero waste to landfill goal. And in order to achieve that, the council needs to be in control of the process. So discouraging and getting businesses to reduce their waste. Um, you know, if, if yeah, so again, I think it needs reconsideration. So I endorse what the last speaker said. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Does anyone else wish to speak on this motion? Um, look, I will speak to it because I'd just like to outline some of the complexities and challenges that the, the council has had to consider in coming to this, um, this decision. And it was not an easy decision. It is absolutely noted that this is something that is difficult. It was a a change for small business at a time where, um, you know, we've experienced uh, some difficulties in terms of COVID having um, impacts on our small businesses. And that was absolutely a consideration of council. Um, perhaps if I can explain how we got to this point, the current um, commercial service that we, uh, that we provide is outdated. It is really just simply an add-on to our residential waste service. It's, it's not a separate service and it never has been. Um, and if we are to go down the path of setting up a proper commercial service in a modern way, it would be a significant cost to all of our ratepayers. Um, we're making a major change to our residential waste service in October. And that is really a trigger point for this change in that we're moving from two bins to three bins for our residential um, for our, our residential rate payers. We're adding a food and organics bin and collecting that weekly. We're reducing the general waste bin by roughly half and picking that up fortnightly. And our uh, recycling stays the same. And our assessment is that that just won't work for commercial businesses with the exception perhaps of those running with a very, very small um, uh, staff complement in a, in a sort of a office house situation. And for those that work from home or have um, offices in home, that won't, um, that won't change. They are still eligible because they are still considered residential rate payers. We know this is a significant change for our commercial businesses. We were very keen to provide as much notice as possible, which was nine months. And we have offered not only a rebate for the first year, but to consider the impact and then to consider further rebates going forward. Um, we're also providing on-ground support so that our waste team can go to businesses and talk to them about what their options would be for commercial services. We understand that getting to zero waste um, to landfill is not just about handing over waste to private providers, but we sincerely believe that um, modern commercial options um, that we cannot provide at the City of Vincent without a massive injection of infrastructure and spending and can be offered by commercial um, rubbish um, businesses, um, such as the ability to collect single um, recycling streams like cardboard, glass and uh, containers that are refundable. At the moment, we offer one bin and it's commingled recycling. Most metropolitan councils don't, either don't provide a commercial waste service, such as one or Joondal up, or they charge separately in addition to rates for a commercial service, such as Perth, Stirling, Fremantle, Subiaco and South Perth. So the norm in across the metro area is to uh, not provide a commercial waste service charge or to, or to pay or to make businesses pay additional to it. Regardless of that, I understand that we're dealing with a situation where we currently have businesses who have been getting a service, whether it's contemporary or not, and that the city has made the decision that that does need to change. We really do need to make this decision if we're going to go down the path of the three bin organic system for residents. We are obliged to do that under the state government's waste policy by 2025, and we're also obliged to do it to try to reduce waste going to landfill. Currently, we've done an assessment of our green topped bins, which goes uh, to landfill, and about 55% of that is organics and food. So we stand to um, make significant gains in meeting our target by going to FOGO. Some of the other issues um, is that 
as I mentioned, the cost. We've estimated the capital cost of going to a proper commercial waste service where we buy proper trucks that can take um, the range of commercial bins would be in the order of 1.365 million and an annual operating cost of about $430,000. And that doesn't include the need to purchase new bins in all of the different sizes that uh, commercial services offer. And it doesn't include the disposal and recycling costs because we're already bearing that. So we've taken that on board. Um, we are looking at rebating the full cost to uh, commercial ratepayers. It currently costs us about $930,000 to run this service as an add-on to our residential waste service. And we are rebating that entirely back to commercial ratepayers. Um, and that is something that we, again, have asked our administration to provide us with a report within six months of this implementation to see what the on-ground experience is, to see what the impact has been, and to continue to provide support where needed. Um, we have also developed some scenarios to show our uh, businesses how they could potentially benefit with less bins and a more tailored service. And we're prepared for our waste team to come out and talk to any business that would like to go through um, how they could better manage their waste. Because this could ultimately not only result in a better waste management, but less waste overall going to landfill. If we can capture the food waste from businesses, capture the cardboard, capture the glass and reduce the rubbish going to landfill. So it's not about trying to abrogate our responsibility, but it's about whether we can afford to have a significant cost to have a modern commercial waste service set it up with all ratepayers contributing and then have to compete in the commercial market. We can't even guarantee that we could compete um, being a local government. We know that City of Perth does run their own service and we have um, looked at the scenarios based on the City of Perth rates and we've actually used the City of Perth to run our Beattie Park waste service and we have saved 50% by going through that commercial service with the City of Perth. So I don't want to um, underestimate that this is a significant change and I would like to talk to any business that is going to um, experience significant costs and see whether our waste team can talk to them and help them provide um, some services. I think in terms of the motion, it would be difficult to, to delay this for the 12 months, given that we are trying to roll out FOGO. But in terms of the other point about acting for an agent, I think that, you know, I'd be happy to get some more advice on that from the administration. And it was something that council members did raise at the time. I think it will come down to whether our procurement, et cetera, would um, enable us to do that. So um, I'm not really speaking for or against this motion. I just wanted to provide some information to you. Um, and I think there are parts of this motion that we can look into. I think that B would be part B would be difficult given our desire to move forward with FOGO three bin system for residents. You, um, just before you do speak, Cam, um, as a mover, you will close debate. Yep, happy to do that. Um, but right. Just before you do that, we'll just me? check. But um, before Cam moves to close debate, does anyone else wish to speak to this motion? Yeah, just for the sake of brevity, we'll try and combine it into one speaker. Um, so there's a few points, Mayor. Thanks very much for the detailed response. Um, you know, it, it does sound like you've made up your minds and this is going to happen uh, come hell or high water. But, uh, you know, I think on, on behalf of business owners in the city of Vincent, it, um, it sounds like there are already also plenty of options for you to consider. Um, and, you know, Mayor, you, you laid out a lot of them just there now. Um, you know, there are things like, could the city of Perth provide this service? Are there other options around the existing wheelie bins without needing to replace the entire fleet of existing wheelie bins? Um, you know, I know for my business that they it uses the exact same wheelie bins as I have at home. So why can't we just have a, a red lid and a, and a, and a yellow lid um, at, as we currently have at the, in the business? So, um, you know, what I, what I would really like to see is, you know, it sounds like you've taken the worst case scenario uh, for businesses and you've, and you haven't really considered the other options that, might make our lives easier and make it easier to do business in the city of Vincent. So uh, thanks very much, guys, and I commend the motion. Thank you. Thank you. So Cam's closed the debate, so I will now call for people to vote on the motion. All those in favour?
I've got around 14. 16, and all those against? Thank you, that's been carried. Okay, next speaker, please. Um, come forward, oh, sorry, Paul. Oh, you can be next. <laughs> Madam Mayor, councillors, members of the community. My name's Paul Cotsoglo. I have um, sent a couple of items through today and thank you for receiving them. I am speaking on this one in relation to the independent policy review for the planning and development policies that are applied in the City of Vincent. Those of you Mr. Mayor, from 10 or 11 years ago, will recall me sitting here and I um, regularly attend this council chamber and uh, take up a lot of your time. I thank you for your service and listening to me. Today, I'm here as a private citizen. Um, I'm familiar, familiar with the city of Vincent and the application of its planning framework and policies. I am the majority shareholder of a planning practice that operates throughout Australia and for a range of very substantial companies. I'm here today um, accompanied by a landowner who's not registered as an elector apparently. Um, so I have somebody else to second this motion today. But the process that they were required to go through, um, in my view, was unnecessary, took excessive time and was um, regrettably quite expensive. And I've been um, a city so planner. Paul, just might be worth getting to the motion because we're sort right. of getting to the debate. All right. I think that would be so kind. The motion, well, Madam Mayor, my, the reason for me attending today is because, in my opinion, the city's planning department um, applies policy and that policy is derived from the council. As a result, I don't think it's a particularly good, pract uh, well practiced in this local authority. So I'd ask the council well, the, to move the following. I'd ask that the following resolution be considered by this electors meeting. Council resolved to undertake an independent review of its planning and development policies as the policies are often applied with little realistic achievement or benefit in terms of the aims and objectives of the policies. The policy review should be undertaken independently by parties expert in the field of statutory planning, including the application of planning policy. The review should be completed within the next three to six months. The key components of the review would be to one, assess the current practices in terms of the development and application of the council's planning and development policies. Two, measure the effectiveness of the council's planning and development policies against independently very verifiable criteria and whether the aims and objectives set out in the policies are in fact being achieved. My view is they're not. Three, establish the legitimacy and legality of policy application so as to confirm or otherwise if council's planning and development policies are being correctly implemented. For example, the use of percent for art funds for purposes other than on properties on which the fees are imposed, parking contributions when parking is not provided within 200 metres of the development site, or measurements for assessment of power or water saving. If they're not, what rectification needs to happen to ensure the correct application of the council policies? Four, advise and recommend to council the appropriate strategy to adopt and apply policies to ensure fair and appropriate application of policy to achieve the desired outcomes in a legally correct and financially fair manner. I suggest consideration of public workshops with practitioners operating within the jurisdiction may and should be considered. And then finally, point five, presentation of a report containing findings and recommendations to council, not later than September, 2021, Madam Mayor. That's my motion. I'd like to put that place or we'll move you. it. Thank I'm you very sorry. much, Paul. Thank Can you. I have a seconder for the motion? Seconded by Ron Alexander. Do you wish to speak to it, Ron? Or 
uh, Madam Mayor and uh, councillors, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I support the motion uh, based on uh, a benefits approach and then also uh, just looking at the service, the cost and the value of that service. So a review seeking uh, the necessity of, uh, of some of the policies I think uh, can't do any harm. Thank you, Ron. Is there any other speakers on this item? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Yep. We have 15 for and those against, we have none against. So that motion is carried. Thank you, Paul. Um, there was a lady at the back that wanted to come forward, so please do. Thank you. Um, thank you for your time, Mayor Cole and councillors. Um, I confirm that my husband and I reside at 33 The Boulevard in Mount Hawthorne. I'm here tonight to voice my concerns regarding the recent character retention and heritage areas amendments to the local planning policy of small sections of three streets in Mount Hawthorne, namely the Boulevard, Kalgoorlie and Matlock. My husband and I are fervently opposed to the suggestion of our house falling under this character retention policy. As owners of our property, we have every right to develop or improve our land subject to council building requirements as all other residents in our suburb. We are concerned that the possible inclusion of our home in the retention scheme will have a negative effect on our property. Our views may be different if the entire suburb wish to be included in some form of character retention. However, to single out small sections of three streets seems preposterous and begs the question why. We are concerned that the current push for consideration of character retention for our street is motivated motivated by a core group who tried to approach us two years ago at an annual Christmas street social event where alcohol was present to agree to the scheme without providing proper information and consideration to what it entailed. It seemed they were running their personal agenda in response to a recent building application that directly affected them. This is not the Mount Hawthorne way. It is a community whereby the greater good Sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you mid-flow. I just wanted to check. Um, you may have been coming along to our council briefing this evening. Oh, um, because that is what I said I was here for downstairs. Yes, it doesn't appear that you're here to present a motion as such. Uh -huh. So um, apologies, that wasn't explained. So right. we're having the annual general meeting first and then we're going to have the council briefing directly following this. Oh. But just to add a complication, <laughs> The matter has actually been withdrawn <laughs> from the agenda. Has it? And uh, we were expecting all that all submitters should have been um, informed this afternoon. Um, right. But uh, it is. Can I just ask? Is that because it is no longer going ahead? No, it will still come. We'll come to the March meeting. Um, I'm very happy to take your details and speak to you about this. Um, that would be long week. So um, if you could, yeah, because there are some If you concerns. could leave your details with Emily. That would um, be great. I mean, if you want to put forward a motion about this to the AGM, you're very welcome to, um, but otherwise we can just deal with this through the normal council process. And um, Yeah, I don't think that a motion would be appropriate at okay. this point, but yeah. um, to sure. cancel it, like, would that be a motion or...? Uh, well, it would, still, we, it would still have to go through the council process. First, so, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. beautiful. But thank you. Sorry that um, for the confusion. Is anyone else here waiting for the council um, meeting, the council briefing? Yep, so that will follow on directly after this meeting. Yep. Okay, so uh, next speaker, please. We have a, so we do, we do have um, Kathy over here and then we'll go to you, Mary. Good evening, um, Kathleen Rufo of 8 Monmouth Street, Mount Lawley. Um, I'm here this evening to speak about the community consultation of the park at 10 Monmouth Street, Mount Lawley. So at the end of last year, there was a community consultation with only two limited options available for the community to comment and give feedback on. And I, we are aware that it is up for consultation with council in March. So um, the motion that I wish the council to consider this evening is that the city considers a third option of upgrading of upgrading the park's facilities at 10 Monmouth Street along with the current options of one, continue maintaining 10 Monmouth Street 
at its current at its current condition or sell the land and this to be subject of the current community consulta community consultation so firstly so um, Kathy, just before you get to that i'll just call for a second of the oh, motion sorry. that's been seconded so what's your name lisa, lisa. Coyle, C -O -Y -L -E. thank you lisa go ahead thank you so firstly, um, I've lived in the area with my husband and son for over 20 years and my husband's had the property for over 40 years and while I've been in, living in the area, um, it's been green, lovely green grass thanks to the council by, by, by providing reticulation. It did have luscious three green mature trees, a tree verge, it had seating. So what the consultation in their communication failed to actually communicate with the, with the community is what did it look like before? So people are presuming when they look at the park now, that's what it looked like. That's what it looked like 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, but that's not the case. So firstly, um, from a historical point of view, 10 Monmouth Street, Mount Lawley was acquired by the city of Perth in nine, December 1968 for public works recreation ground. Therefore, if one of the options that was listed on the community consultation was to sell the park, it would negate the reason of the original property acquisition by the City of Perth. Even though the City of Perth, sorry, even though the City of Vincent holds the current title of the land of freehold of this property, park, the council ha may have the legal rights to sell the property. However, the council also has a moral obligation in respecting the past explicit conditions attached with the property. And that is, it was specifically quoted on the title that it was a recreation ground, a park, not for the city of Vincent 52 years later to actually sell it as a money making enterprise. So that is my first quote from a um, historical point of view. Secondly, um, the other condition, sorry, the other option was actually that was in the community consultation was to maintain 10 Monmouth Street at its current condition. The current condition is treeless. The current condition, there is no shade. The trees that were on the park, one was removed by council um, 10, 15 years ago. The other two mature trees that provide the tray, unfortunately fell over during the hailstorm. So the trees have actually disappeared. There was seating in the park that has disappeared. So the amenities that used to be there, the local community cannot enjoy. So while you had the camera present on the park um, a few weeks ago to observe during the consultation, while it was hot, and if you notice on those, if whoever looks at those, like in the big certain times of the day, nobody would visit the park when there's no trees. Secondly, um, the other items that were missing um, from the council, so sorry, I'll go back one. So in your brochure, you, the comment was 10 Monmouth Street does not meet the minimum, minimum requirements for a local park. However, it was the council's neglect over the past 10 to 15 years that has caused the park to look like that. Okay. Um, so we strongly support the council returning the park to its original condition. The option that you made available was only to continue maintaining 10 Monmouth Street. That is treeless, no seating. Um, I noted in your annual report that you planted 573 trees and 4,000 shrubs in the past financial year. However, surely one or two wouldn't have gone astray at 10 Monmouth Street. So 
So it is recommended that the council respect and upholds the intention of the then City of Perth, 1968 City of Perth acquisition of the land for recreational ground as it was needed in 1968 as a playground. And even though in 1968, we had less population in Perth, there's certainly a higher density living around the area. We have people in apartments on William Street with dogs that visit the park. Um, the park is certainly not underperforming. The park is not an R40 site. It is a much loved park by the community. So we strongly oppose the sale of the park of 10 Mom Mouth Street, Mount Lawley and we're against it being turned into a development site. It has been a park for recreational ground for over 50 years, as that was the purpose of the City of Perth acquisition in 1968. So we wish to make sure that there is a third option besides continue maintaining 10 Mon Mount Street in its current tradition, or to sell the land. So we are suggesting a third option that you upgrade the parks facility while you're doing the current community consultation that is upcoming in March this year. So our preference is to the trees to be replaced that were unfortunately uprooted and taken away. Um, removed some of the grassed areas and put some native shrubs. You put 4,000 shrubs in the other parts of the city of Vincent. Um, have some seating so the elderly in the area have got somewhere to sit and enjoy. Lots of dogs go to the park, so a dog park, we, maybe a senior citizen playground. We should have passive recreational space. Should be low maintenance landscaping as the council advises um, our residents to do. Um, so in conclusion, we wish the council to add an extra option to, your to the community consultation with the current com community consultation. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy. Lisa, do you wish to speak to the motion? Um, aside, sorry, Lisa Coyle from 12 Mont Street, so I also about the park. I've also been a resident for 20 years and watched my little family grow up there and use the park every day. Um, it has changed. So, and obviously the community, the nature of the community is cyclical. We've seen um, Neighbours change with small kids as they grow up. The, uh, the urban infill, we've seen a lot of apartments. And that little park has been a lifeblood. It's 500 square metres. It's not a lot. But it's so important. And even in its degraded state, it's still in daily use by dog owners, mainly dog owners now, purely because there is no shade, there is no seating, and the turf has been... It used to be lush and green and gorgeous. We would have picnics, but now it's dry and brittle and it's pretty much just for dog purposes. Mind you, there's some Whopper students at the back of us that have used it for fit shooting films, all that kind of thing. We'd, I've seen it used for hen's days. My, kid, my daughter used to have picnics in there. She learned to ride her bike in there. She's had her birthday parties in there. The neighbours used it for lemonade stands. It was a real heart of our community. And even two weeks ago during COVID, we got a letter from further down Monmouth Street, which wasn't even in the consultative area. So I don't even know who these people are, but they wanted to have a street meet and greet. And they, their chosen place was in our park, which there is nowhere else for us to go. It's on, it's bordered by both sides by William Street and Walcott. It is the only safe way place we can get to without crossing main roads. So, it is a vital that we maintain this. And I think just further to Cathy's point that the consultative process was flawed purely because it didn't give us the third option, which was to maintain it in its original state. So if you look at it now and look at it 10 years ago, two different parks. You know, we had lush, huge mature trees, you know, that provided, we played botch, we played cricket. You know, all of it because it was a lush green lawn that was uh, great for that kind of thing. And now it's, it, you know, sadly it has been allowed to be degraded. But if we could have that option to just, and we're not asking for the world, we're not asking for fencing or anything elaborate, a couple of mature trees and a seat or two. 
and then it would be enjoyed by so many more. And, and again, the community evolves. We do see that change. And as Kathy and I are both long-term residents, we have watched the community change. But, and we know it's going to get busier. And like, obviously we'll speak further in March, but it, it, to, to sell this land for apartments, for two apartments, it's, it's just a nonsense when it's against your public open space strategy, your greening strategy. You've got this little area right there when you're actively looking for more green space. And we're sitting there. And all it would take was three trees and a chair. So please say that part. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Are there any other speakers on this item? Thank you, Dudley Meyer Highgate. Yeah, I was really disappointed to see that there were only two options that were presented. So the web, St Vincent's webpage just has the two options on there. It's just basically sell the land to generate funds for other parks or continue maintaining 10 Monmouth Street. So I decided to go and have a walk. I'd heard there was a camera there, so I decided to have a go, go and walk. And it was late in the afternoon and I met three separate dog owners who were using the park. And needless to say, they were upset and they were angry about the proposal, but they were also concerned about some other things that have been going on around this proposal. Firstly, it's, it's a potentially a local park, which is defining a public open space strategy as having a four meter, 400 metre catchment. So the document on the web just talked about a 200 metre catchment and the map on the web just shows a 200 metre catchment, if that. It doesn't show the full catchment there. Secondly, they were concerned because the city's mapping system was suddenly changed from showing the lot as a reserve to vacant land. None of the other reserves had that change made. There was also concern when they read the mayor's comment in the Eastern Report of that is, and I'm quoting, a small lot in the middle of a suburban area with limited street parking. This is inconsistent with the public open space hierarchy that you've got. This is a potential local um, park. Sorry, Dudley, I, you know, I'm happy to check the record, but I don't... Where was that quoted? I don't recall saying that. I've, I've got the copy here. Community news. I'll look it up and I'll just see where that came from because... It was the Eastern Reporter. No. I usually remember what I say to the papers. Yeah, they may have misquoted you. That, and that's not the... I don't recall introducing parking at any point about this. Uh, I didn't print it out here. I can send it to you. It's, it's fine. If you send that to me, I'd just like to definitely. fact check myself on that one because I don't yeah. recall saying that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so I, I did see it because I do get the Eastern Reporter, although I'm a loyal voice, voice reader. Um, so it's inconsistent with the open space, space hierarchy, which has local parks at the bottom. Um, or at the top of you like it that way. And, it's defined, and, with, and they define local parks as having a, a five minute walking catchment. They're parks that are meant to be walked, walked to. It's only when you get to district parks, which is the third level, that you actually have an expectation that you would drive to that park. So I think there's some consistency also with the commercial waste issue that's raised in that the administration and council seem to have ignored the most obvious option, which is to develop the lot for the purpose that it was initially purchased for, a local park. And to do that in conjunction with the people who are most affected, the local community. I've had a look at it, that it's a very long block, so it has some issues about crime prevention through environmental design, the SEPTED. But you can put a dog park at the very end, use the space more effectively. Um, so I think there are lots of options and the local community should be consulted in order to develop a design that reflects their needs. And once you have that, then you go out and ask them which of the three options they prefer. Thank you. Thank you, Dudley. Are there any further speakers on this item? Thank you. My name is Nurel O'Neill. I live at Matlock Street, Mount Hawthorne. I think this issue is much broader than the area that we, has been discussed in Monmouth Street. I think this would set a dangerous precedent for all public open spaces if the council can simply pick off a piece without proper consultation process and choose to sell it whenever the funds are required from the overt and excessive spending that we've all witnessed over the last few years. The reason I raise that because when the first time Monmouth Street was on the hit list, so too was uh, an area of land in Brentham Street in Leederville. 
that was suggested that that too was going to be sold off for no other reason that it wasn't being used, with, again, without any justification, consultation at all. In these times, we, refer, we reflect on how COVID has impacted on us all. In particular, it has impacted on the need for open space. That has been proven time and time again, the mental health of the community to have access to open space and not considered that that open space is under threat for sale to generate a profit. Also harking back to the original landowners, I don't believe that that land, even though there may be more recent titles, is available to the council to sell. It, it is not their land to sell in the first place and often should be returned to its rightful owners, which in my view is this nation's first peoples who don't, even though we have a reconciliation program, don't seem to get much mention when there's profit to be generated from the sale of land. So I would really urge you to reconsider or fully consider the sale of any open space because I'm sorry, but I don't believe it is the right of the council to sell that open space. It doesn't belong to them. It belongs to people. It has always belonged to people, past, present and future. Thank you. Are there any further speakers on this item? Um, just, I do just wish to speak to address the point of Brentham Street that Narelle O'Neill raised. Um, that was put to council by administration and administration made it clear that that land was not for sale. Um, that uh, was not something that was supported by council. And in terms of the item that we're looking at, no decision has been made and it has been made clear that if it was to be sold, it would go towards um, further open space to meet um, the growing needs of our city and the city's public open space strategy is about creating more public open space, not reducing public space. So um, thank you for your comments. Uh, does the mover of the motion wish to close debate? Okay, thank you. I'll put the motion, all those in favour? Okay. 17 in favour, any against? None against, that motion is carried. Thank you, we'll move on to our next motion. Thank you, Mary. Okay. As a resident of North Perth in the city of Vincent, and as an environmental scientist with experience in catchment management, I wish to move the following motion. That the community requests that the city adopts the following actions in order to protect our water catchments in accordance with the adopted sustainable environment strategy, also in accordance with much needed climate change action, and in particular, request that the city raises community awareness of these issues through such me um, mechanisms as letterbox brochures. So firstly, encourage residents to replace fake grass with real grass and also to reduce the size of paved areas on their blocks. Secondly, advise all landholders and mowing contractors to remove catches from their mowers and leave lawn clippings in situ. So it's recycling on site. Thirdly, increase greening, urban cooling and wildlife habitat by planting more trees and shrubs that are native to this area. Four, stop the planting of deciduous trees in verges, parks and public spaces, places and encourage the community to do likewise. Five, promote the existing brochure which identifies native plants that are suitable to the soil types in Vincent. Six, number six, provide information to the community about environmental weeds. Seven, reduce fertiliser use and export to waterways. 
And finally, number eight, to stop using glyphosate. Thank you, Mary. Is there a seconder for this motion? Seconded by Dudley Meyer. Please go ahead. Do you wish to speak to it further? Um, well, this is all about the management of the, the waterways runoff. And with climate change, of course, our rainfall is declining or has declined and we get extreme weather events. But there is a major problem with excess nutrients running into the Swan River. Um, and I mean, this has been going on for some years, but there's a real need to raise awareness in the community about the factors that um, cause this nutrient, extra, extra nutrient runoff. And the, the issue with taking uh, the um, catcher off people's mowers is to recycle in situ and then it can be a closed system for nutrients, particularly phosphorus, and you don't have to fertilise. And it also stops that business of people tipping their, putting their lawn clippings, which go to, la to landfill and they produce methane. So, and it's amazing I see people doing that. Now that advice not to, you know, to take the catcher off your mowers, we got from a top scientist, Dr. Robert Geritzi, back in the 90s in catchment management. And I, I recall that, you know, I said to my son, you know, take the catcher off the mower. I said, just try it. Did it once and the catcher was in the garage ever after. So, um, uh, and, and we don't, you don't fertilise your lawn unless it shows symptoms of, um, yeah. So this massive over fertilising and the nature of our soils in this area is that nutrients go straight through, unfortunately. So storm events, stormwater drainage into the local lakes and things, um, you know, then the water quality is poor. And we all know we've had algal blooms in the Swan River and some of them have been toxic. Um, it would be interesting to see what happens in the next few days if we get some hot still weather. I don't know if you recall in the year 2000, January 2000, when those two cyclone, ends of cyclones came through Perth, there was a massive algal bloom in the Swan River because, a, you know, a massive um, export of um, fresh water from the catchments, including the Avon, with high nutrient status, and it sits over the salt water in the, in the river. And I remember looking out the window and thought, uh-oh. Anyway, massive algal bloom, and it was a toxic one. So the aerosol was actually toxic. And... I mean, a couple of, well, was it last summer, the one before there was a bloom? So it's a big issue. And um, a lot of people are unaware of using too much fertiliser um, because it's pushed by, you know, people selling it. So, um, yeah, they're just ways of, uh, um, but also increasing um, cover of vegetation in our suburbs. There's too many houses around me where their front garden is brick paved, hard surface, <laughs> crazy, um, you know, and that's a heat bank. So it's a climate change issue. We need more urban canopy, urban greening, not less. Anyway, I'm, um, I, I say that also as a professional environmental scientist, I worked in catchment management for many years in the 90s. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um, I'll leave it there. Is there any questions or anything? Thank you, Mary. Um, I'll go to the second. Do you wish to speak to the motion? Are there any further speakers on this motion? Yes, Geraldine. Geraldine Box from North Perth. Um, just like to add something to what Mary was saying um, about the grass and about uh, people when their verges are being mown, often by contractors or whatever. The contractors are blowing those grass clippings onto the road uh, and then those glass, grass clippings and uh, are swept down and go into our stormwater drains. And I'm wondering, just wondering if councils ever thought of some way of advising people who mow verges <laughs> that that's, that's not the thing to do, that they should be doing either what Mary suggested, taking, off the, taking the catcher off and not blowing it onto the street. It's it's as if they're littering the street. I mean, if you threw paper like that onto the street, you'd be charged with littering. So 
um, the consequences of that green waste going onto the road and into our stormwater is, um, has the same outcome as, as the things that Mary was listing. So thanks for that, just an added item. Thank you, Geraldine. Are there any further speakers on the motion? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Twelve for and any against? None against. Thank you. The motion is carried. Uh, we do have uh, some remaining motions. So I've got Ron Alexander and Dudley Meyer. Would either of you wish to come forward? Thank Thanks, Ron. Uh, Ron Alexander, 180 Palmerston Street, Perth. And uh, Madam Mayor, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I do note that there's a lot of good work done and tonight seems a, about one of those sessions about uh, what we'd like to see a little bit uh, differently. Uh, I have two motions. One's uh, very, very quick, and that's in regards uh, some of the lanes in uh, the city of Vincent, in particular one next to our property and uh, a range of uh, uh, my neighbours, which the motion reads like this, the transfer of Daisy Lane and five other lanes from the city of Vincent to the state government. Please explain why these lanes have been transferred to state government control. Please explain why only six and not 40 or so other lanes are uh, only been transferred. And in any transfer of Daisy Lane, please ensure there is a caveat that reads as follows, that the residents abutting Daisy Lane each have the right to approve or reject any changes whatsoever to Daisy Lanes. This includes any developments. For clarity, that is 100% of the vote is required for any changes. So, Ron, I've just recalled that um, Paul mentioned that you're not an elector. Um, no, no, Oh, sorry, my apologies. Um, I did think that was a bit odd, odd given that you live in the city of um, Vincent, so I'm mixing you up. Please go ahead. So um, I'll, you've finished reading your motion. Is there a seconder for this motion? Seconded by Paul. Do you wish to speak to it further, Ron? Uh, no. No, I think that was uh, fairly clear. Okay. Um, does anyone else wish to speak to this motion? Okay. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? We have 12 for, anyone voting against? No one against, so that's carried. And Ron, you have a second motion? Uh, yes, the second motion is a tad more uh, extensive in a couple of parts. And uh, the quick motion preamble is with regards to Hyde Park, that an urgent updated master plan for the vision that residents and councillors want Hyde Park to be as required immediately. Uh, a range of reasons uh, for that. Um, Starting with, and I'll, um, I'll read the motion if, uh, if, if you like. Um, the electors of the City of Vincent resolve the following. All works involving removal of grass and sand and the placement of, of gravel um, for paths or other purposes and planting of ivy stops immediately and do not recommend um, and not recommend until a comprehensive master planning process has been completed. And just for, for information, um, sometimes ivy seems like a good idea, um, but uh, the inundation of it is uh, a pleasant thing for rats, rubbish and, uh, and dog poo, um, as opposed to some uh, lovely loamy soils. Two, that the Hyde Park Master Plan shall address matters, including shade-friendly grass to be immediately planted in patchy areas and the recently gravelled area which is used uh, now as a road near the roundabout and the main entrance of Glendower also have some grass uh, replanted in there. Instigate actions to reverse uh, the water quality by 21, 22 and safeguard the wildlife. Um, I, I use the park now, our neighbours use it about three times a day each. And we noted last year, the number of uh, wildlife that uh, that died, and I understand due to uh, due to botulism. Um, so we would like to see something happen with that water quality, and we do understand some of the the difficulties in that. 
make public information in the city's possession in relation to the water quality assessment and recommendations and the city to take immediate action to have the water quality and associated drains maintained to a standard and quality recommended by AR Water, Craig Roth, Leinter and others. All development works either planned or approved do not proceed until completion of a revised Hyde Park master plan has been the subject of community consultation referred to improved by the Heritage Council of Western Australia and the Council of the City of Vincent. Four, the Council of the City of Vincent seeks special expert input for the review of recent works and proposed plans for Hyde Park not later than the first week of April 2021. The brief for the specialist input would be the subject of a review by the Hyde Park Working Group established by the Council of the City of Vincent. <coughs> The main entrance to Hyde Park near the roundabout on Glendower Street to be investigated with the following actions to beautify it, including removing painting or softening some of the yellow bollards referred to in the neighbourhood as the yellow peril and other gas infrastructure and other in innovations, uh, including wayfinding. Uh, for example, painting the bollards green with reflective tape to ensure visibility, perhaps. The City of Vincent Hyde Park Working Group shall consist of elected members and appropriate community members. The City of Vincent Hyde Park Working Group to be called for and established within one month from the date of this meeting. The Hyde Park Working Group shall provide input and direction on the style of Hyde Park Gardens themes and make comment on plans and associated reports prepared by the specialist. In addition, the Hyde Park Working Group would be expected to provide input and comment on plans and concepts which may under consideration previously considered or previously approved for Hyde Park and considered for inclusion in the Hyde Park Master Plan. The Council of the City of Vincent seeks specialist input for the design services inputs from appropriately qualified and experienced independent consultants and allocate an appropriate budget to engage specialist consultants to prepare the Master Plan for community consultation. Heritage Council of Western Australian approval or guidance as necessary, council adoption and approval. All community consultation will include electronic media, signs on site and letters to owners and residents with a minimum of 28 days public submission uh, period. And that's supported by a range of abutting residents. Thank you very much, Ron. I understand, Paul, you're seconding this motion. Is it? Yes, thank you. We are joined by other neighbours here tonight, and um, some were unable to attend, but have um, provided us support for our representation. The gravels resulting in blowers, blowing leaves and dust onto the road and into our homes. It's noisy, and it's particularly noisy. There's two sorts of blowers that are used. One is extremely noisy. Um, the gravel is, and parts of the grass are being used as a thoroughfare, particularly by the person that um, cleans the barbecues, but also uh, by the people that drive the little green truck around. Um, we are reducing the area of green space for our community to use. And anyone that pays close attention to the use of Hyde Park will know now that there are large family gatherings, 20, 30 people, that concentrate on diminishing uh, areas of grass. This increases the wear and tear on that grass. Gravel is running off the pathways onto roads and onto the walkways in the Hyde Park area and the roads immediately adjoining. It goes to the point that one of the previous speakers made about the use of the roadway and the drains resulting in runoff into the water table that is not appropriate and diminishes the quality of the water. Hyde Park is a park, it's not a car park, although it's becoming a car park. It's becoming a thoroughfare for vehicles. It's registered on the State Register of Heritage Places. It is an extremely important place to both the Noongar people as well as the state's uh, uh, colonial heritage. I ask when were the changes that are currently being undertaken ever approved and I don't understand that they were 
And if they were, I would appreciate a thorough and diligent report pointing out the facts contained in a council report so we can uh, properly analyse it. I am concerned about proposals around the uh, ablution facilities um, being advertised on Facebook and me hearing about it third hand from somebody that tells me what's going on in the neighbourhood when they live in another suburb completely. I suggest and I request that the consultation involves signage on site and all the procedures that council requires when I am doing a development application for a proponent, that should be the starting point for the local authority as a base. The concentration of large groups leaves a lot to be, um, leaves the grass and the park in a very difficult situation. You can't get a car parking spot around there on the weekend. And I know other members of the community here know that. I appreciate the elected members that have taken the time to come and meet with us and uh, visit the site and see what's going on. And I would ask you to pay serious attention to this matter. It's a matter of, um, quite frankly, it is a matter of state significance and it's a place of heritage value of state value. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Are there any further speakers on this motion? Thank you, Mary. Can I just ask a question? You mentioned um, botulism. Was it really um, botulism? Because that's caused by an uh, organism called Clostridium botulinum, which is an anaerobe. Um, I, I don't know whether it was actually tested, um, but if it was, if, um, if you put in aerators, that will, um, you know, and so that the water doesn't become anaerobic. Or it, yeah, so I don't know what the situation was. Um, Mary, I'm aware that our parks team was working closely with uh, bird rescue. Um, I don't have the details. I don't know whether samples were taken to verify. It was believed to be, but I'm not sure whether, the, as I say, I'm not sure if it was actually tested. Um, but we can, perhaps we can answer that question on notice and provide some further response to that. Well, it would have helped because it would have given you feedback or the city feedback in terms of management. So you've got some aerators. I don't know whether it was an area. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I know that there's um, the parks team are wanting to deal with it in an ongoing way and I'm not quite sure what plans they have, but um, we can find out. Well, an aerator is yeah. a bit different. You're pumping oxygen in <laughs> Thank you, Mary. We'll um, get you some more information about that. Are there any further speakers on this item? Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, my colleagues here and fellow, fellow neighbours, uh, I think, have put a very strong case. But for a daily user over the past 25 years, um, I think such a special place as Hyde Park, which is used by so many and has a very special characteristics characteristic for all members of, of across our society, whether they be people who live in the area, disabled people, people who celebrate their weddings and other functions. Um, it, it, it is really um, something that the City of Vincent throws out to a whole lot of people across Perth. One thing that um, I'm really concerned about as a daily user is that there's a changing complexion to the park. Um, the extent of gravel, the extent of ivy, the diminution of, of uh, grass, and probably the excuse to say is because the, um, the shaded areas don't encourage the growth of normal grasses doesn't mean that there aren't very many opportunities to use grasses that do grow in shaded areas. In addition to that, as Ron has pointed out and, and um, Paul about the concern for the quality of the lake and, and bird life, I, I just think that what, one way the City of Vincent, um, which has done such a great job over many years to really improve the park, uh, is to actually come and talk to us in a more formal way in response to this motion that's been put by Ron. Um, I, I just think that there's a plan afoot in the city of Vincent that's turning Hyde Park into a gravel park. It's diminishing uh, areas where people enjoy picnics, young children running around, and gravel as uh, the gravel is just extending. Um, my concern is that there is, the CEO will be aware that there must be a plan 
that's within and approved within the City of Vincent, which does have a budget, and for, for perhaps good intentions on the part of the horticultural advice that is being received, I think there's been too much of a delegation to a person or persons within the terms of a plan that has not been shared with the local people who are residents and or users of the park. An important part of the motion is to set up a formal consultative process and have a working group of electors and residents that we could in a most positive way address the issues and improve the park even more. But our main concern is not simply the improvement, is to stop the changing complexion of what we are now starting to term gravel park. Thank you. Um, just before you head off, so um, was it just for the um, minutes, did you say Ryan Easton? Ryan Easton, yes. Ryan Easton, my yeah. apologies. 174 so, pump. Brian, thank you very much, Brian. Does anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Nick? Thank you. I, I stand up also to support the motion from Ron Alexander. I've had a long history with uh, Hyde Park indeed, having obtained um, many, many millions of dollars from federal, from the federal government and indeed the state government to ensure that Hyde Park remain the jewel of the crown in, in Vincent. It's a park with heritage value, of course, as has been mentioned, but it's a park that many people enjoy and to see it uh, go to the rack and ruin it is today because it is in fact, I believe, um, much uh, diminished in its value uh, and its, in its amenity to the community. And it's a shame because a lot of money has been spent indeed, some uh, private money, the North Perth Community Bank uh, put uh, $50,000 into that uh, park to ensure that uh, certain, uh, certain matters were in progress before we received federal funding of about $2 million. So to see it go backwards, I think the council uh, needs to needs to support the uh, uh, Ron Alexander motion of setting up a committee to examine this and obtain whatever funds are required, be it through state or federal, or indeed even private uh, enterprise, to ensure that this park remains a pr in pristine condition and in, indeed uh, also uh, retain the character and heritage that we all know it. Uh, that it should that should remain uh, with this uh, with the jewel of the crown we used to call it when I was uh, uh, when I was uh, uh, involved in it uh, many years ago. So I support. Uh, please uh, ensure that we all vote in favour of this because it needs a further examination and further action ASAP. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Are there any further speakers on the motion? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Uh, sorry, Ron, you wish to close debate? Yes, you can do that. My apologies. Go ahead. Uh, Madam Mayor and Council, it's not for a moment do I presume that this Council is not keen on Hyde Park and, and doing its best. So um, I, I appreciate that. But I think what happens sometimes <laughs> is things happen incrementally and, you know, we're very keen just to see what the vision for Hyde Park is. And also, having worked in government, I do understand the difficulties of when you have to make the decisions and find the budget, that it's not all that easy. And I've done a fair bit of work on uh, water quality and what's happening in Western Australia. And to have all the drains cleaned and the ponds cleaned and all those sorts of things is a massive amount of money. So I do understand the cost required with these sorts of things and things can't happen immediately uh, along that front. But what I do worry about is when gardeners have a budget and they're not closely watched, and uh, as Brian Easton uh, uh, has said, and Brian has got um, a pretty fair background as uh, CEO of the Perth Zoo and currently as chairman of the zoo, so uh, he certainly understands these things very well. And I think what can happen is people want to spend their budget and there are I would, I would estimate approximately something like 700% uh, more gravel in Hyde Park from when I moved in in early 2016. Um, so I just think it would be good to have a 
an updated Hyde Park plan and to have a mixture of councillors and interested qualified community members on a group to oversee Hyde Park because it is a gem. I understand you recognise that and we all want it to be, uh, be looked after and not just incrementally um, improved with little bits um, that aren't necessarily approved and work into a plan. So I commend the motion to you and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Ron. Um, that has closed debate, so I will put the motion. All those in favour? I count that as 15. So we have 15 for, is anyone voting against? That's no one against, so that motion is carried. Thank you. Um, Dudley Meyer, I believe you're the last person to bring forward motions this evening. Thank you very much. The, the first motion concerns underground power and it reads that the electors request, one, that the city investigate options for funding a long-term program for, for a long-term program to provide underground, underground power throughout the city. Two, that one option that must be considered is one based on the model developed by the city of Subiaco in the 1980s, in which saw all power put underground within a, in about 20, 35 years, and was mainly based on fun, funding the program by taking out loans, which were paid off by a small increase in annual rates. Three, that any models developed address the issues of equity for community members in the Highgate East area, who have already contributed to have their power put underground, and four, that any models that are developed be used as a basis for consulting the community about the possibility of putting power underground. Is there a seconder for the motion? Seconded by Geraldine Box. Thank you. I think we all know the benefits of underground power, improved canopy, aesthetics, et cetera, et cetera. It's been acknowledged by the staff as well. There was a similar motion at last year's AGM, but the response seemed to misunderstand the intent of the motion. The response was some, something along the lines of we don't have the money. This motion isn't about committing funds. It's about developing alternative fun funding models. And it's based on something that has been proven to be successful. It's asking that we look at the Subiaco model. Subiaco started in 1982 and was scheduled to run for 48 years. It's just amazing. Uh, it was based on Subiaco going it alone and it was completed a few years ago. Um, Subiaco now has all their power underground. It was funded at by taking out loans. I think they were about five years each and paying those loans off by making small increases in the rates. Effectively, the community paid for it, but they paid for it over a 35 to 40 year period. So it was the council, council acting on their behalf, taking out massive loans. So it was a, a small cost. Um, the feedback from Subiaco was that it was popular with the community and the council members, and that it was easy to administer. Now Subiaco and Vincent have similar characteristics, similar book, built form, layouts. Vincent's about twice the size of Subiaco, but it also means we have twice the number of ratepayers. So I think the Subiaco model is quite relevant to Vincent. Coincidentally, our, our neighbours in the town of Cambridge have just about completed putting all their power underground. Their model was different. It combined funds from property owners, the town chipping in and state government co-funding the, the whole process. Vincent, on the other hand, has only had one area put underground, underground and that was in about 2006, Nick will remember it. It was called Highgate East. Uh, Councillor Gonsashevsky is a beneficiary of it. Um, it was co-funded by property owners and the state government as part of the state underground power program. So what happens is the state government every three or four years asks for expressions of interest. There've been six rounds so far. Vincent's been successful in one. And sadly and annoyingly, Vincent didn't even bother putting in an expression of interest in 2016. After the last uh, AGM, I reminded the mayor of her 2017 election commi commitment, which was, and I quote, engaging the community by taking detailed options to the community for full consultation and community endorsement. And I think this is your opportunity to start that, that process. Remember, CBACO initially planned for 48 years. This isn't a five year, 10 year program. It's a long term program that spreads that cost over a long term. So I commend that motion to you all. Um, Geraldine, do you wish to speak to the motion? 
Thanks for that. I think most most councillors anyway know <laughs> where I'm coming from with with some of these things. Um, the the increased canopy anyway is an absolute winner and it has so many positive outcomes from getting increased canopy when you don't have to have the trees trimmed back because the power lines are in the way. Um, it assists the city to reach its greening goals, reduces temperature for humans and insects and birds and other animals on the street, so um, that's a positive thing. Uh, increases the habitat for those birds and insects, um, provides great improvement at street level for pedestrians and cyclists, um, lowers the temperature at street level, and it helps to lower driver speeds because when the canopy grows over, the look of the street appears narrower and drivers of vehicles um, tend to slow down. Uh, reduces the use of by heavy transports and rat runners. Um, and it, in the long run, I would imagine, I can't say this, but it must reduce the costs to the city because of all that pruning that seems to go on each year um, endlessly. Um, and under amenity and safety, removal of poles and wires just affords a much more pleasant place to live, um, more usable streetscape, it reduces the issue of interrupted power when we have our storms going through, removes the risks of pole fires, and these have been, um, they certainly haven't probably caused too much problem in the city of Vincent, but with increasing storms, they will. Um, and it's been shown in other Perth local government areas that retrospect, that uh, which have done this retrospectively, um, there's a general increase in the value of properties. So, gee, I can't see that with the rate of interest at the moment, why we can't just do it, be fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Geraldine. Are there any further speakers on this item? Mary? Just, just briefly, uh, <clears throat> I'm in Commonwealth Avenue, North Perth. Um, we did a survey a couple of years ago about, you know, what Commonwealth Avenue looks like hundred years after the first house was built. But one of the questions was about <coughs> underground power, whether people supported it. And certainly they do. And I hear, you know, there's a few people who really, you know, get annoyed um, that we, with the pruning, it, you know, wrecks the trees, but, you know, um, the poles are need replacing in a lot of cases anyway. So um, really there's a lot of support for it. There's plenty of support for it in the community. Thank you, Mary. Are there any further speakers on this item? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I think that's 13. 14. 14, 4. And those against? We have one voting against at the back. Are you for? So you're going to cause some controversy. <laughs> Okay, we'll add you to the numbers. Thank you. All right, um, Dudley, please go on with your next motion. Uh, so it's abridged. I, I won't move all the stuff that's on the. It's about the code of conduct, and the motion is that the electors request that the city's code of conduct be reviewed and amended, and that the previous requirements for council members to respond to inquiries from members of the community be reinstated prior to the document being advertised for community comment. Is there a seconder for this motion? Seconded by Norelle O'Neill. Thank you. Um, look, I was first, I first became aware of some of these issues about two years ago. People were saying councillors aren't responding. Um, last year I met a former councillor who mentioned that councillors weren't responding. And I told her, remember the code of conduct has a clause that says we, you have to respond within a certain period of time. As a result, I thought I'd go and check the code of conduct so I can let her know what that clause was. What I found was that the requirement had been removed in December 2017, and the manner in which it was removed, I find totally unacceptable. The, remote, the report that went to council in December 2017 said that only five clauses had been removed from the previous code of conduct. It listed those five clauses, but the communications clause, which was the relevant one, was not shown. So if you read the report, you didn't have an indication. The report didn't have a document with track changes so you could see what had changed. It didn't even have a copy of the old code of conduct. So 
I can always find it out, but other members of the community may have, have problems. Uh, the staff argue that it was essentially an internal document, so there's no need to advertise it. The council agreed with us, with this and it uh, wasn't advertised. The re report also pointed out that all council members and staff had the opportunity to provide feedback before it came to council. So I'm, uh, I'm assuming that all councillors were aware, um, noticing the, the, the decrease in responses from the council. I think that that must be the case that they were aware. But I must acknowledge that I have heard lots of reports um, from community members saying that there are two or three councils, and it's always the same two or three names come, coming up that are still responding to the community. As I said, the manner in which it was removed is unacceptable, and I'd characterise it as not being done in an open manner. Now, coincidentally, last week, the Local Government Act was amended uh, in order to force councils to adopt a model code of conduct. The Act allows the councils to add additional requirements to that model. It's stipulated in section 5104, clause three. So I ask that the requirement to respond to the community be reinstated and that the code be advertised for the public to comment on. Thank you. Does a seconder wish to speak to the motion? Not necessarily speak in great depth to the motion, but I'd just like to provide my own experience in dealing with the council. Um, as stated, there are several councillors who are fantastic at responding and others who are certainly not that great at responding. I can categorically say too, with 100% accuracy, that every time I have tried to call the City of Vincent in the last 12 months, I have immediately gone to um, voice on hold where I'm bombarded with advertisements for the council and how I should be going to the website. I feel that there seems to be some intention to actively dissuade the community from communicating directly with the staff and the council. I think that needs to be addressed. I haven't come across that in the 20, 30 plus years I've lived in the council before. I find the website in terms of uh, a mechanism to engage with the council substandard. There are multiple pages that go absolutely nowhere, yet we've paid in excess of $100,000 for a substandard website. So I think there are multiple issues in addition to the ones that, uh, that this motion pertain to that the council needs to perhaps spend a little less time on self-promotion and actually... Um, Noelle, just please, could you remain respectful? Yeah. I'm just asking, it's not um, it's not nice to hear that sort of um, assertion about council members. That's unfortunate that you find it not nice. I'm just conveying to you an opinion that perhaps the council may like to, to reconsider its communication with the community and actually uh, ensure that it is accessible by both the council staff and councillors. Thank you. And there was no disrespect intended. It was simply uh, how my, just conveying my personal experience. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further speakers on this motion? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Twelve for anyone against? None against. I declare that carried. The third motion is about the AGM, and the motion reads that in future years the city improve the promotion of the annual general meeting of electors as an opportunity for the community to be engaged and have their say, and that any promotion emphasises that the community members may speak on any issue relating to Vincent or may or may move motions that must be by be considered by council if passed. Can I call on a seconder for the motion? Seconded by Geraldine. So I think we could all agree that the AGM is the best opportunity for the community to have their say on items that are part of their agenda rather than the, the council's agenda. So we're not responding to a specific thing. We're bringing up issues that are important to us I think um, this is AGM has been promoted poorly. Um, 
I did some research and in October 2017, Walga sought the city's comments about changing the Local Government Act to remove the requirement to have an AGM. The staff at that stage supported that and they said it should get rid of the requirement. Walga made a similar suggestion in 2019 and there was a change of heart, a change of administration, I think brought the heart. The, the staff said in their response, um, that the AGM supports accountability and representation and should be mandatory. And the council supported that. Which brings us to how it's promoted this year. Um, I expect that the most, most of the people here are here because of word of mouth rather than advertising. There was some advertising and um, I checked out some of the advertising. So here's a copy of The Voice from 23rd of January. It's got Cam Sinclair on the front cover and there's an ad for the AGM. And it's here on the inside back cover right at the bottom, a place that no one, I think, would look at. Um, there was an ad in the recent edition of The Voice, and the thing that was consistent, and it's there because of the change of date, and the thing that's consistent with both of the ads is they basically say that the purpose of the meeting is to accept the annual report. There's no mention of the fact that community members can get up and speak and make statements or move motions. Uh, I think that the opportunities afforded by the AGM, AGM are not promoted enough and are not well advertised. Um, I think you have to allow a longer period. So you're trying to squeeze it into an hour. We're already two hours now. If you promote it more and you get more people involved, and it's not just people having a go at the council or the city or anything like that, people will get up and say, we, we support what you're doing. So I think you've got to embrace it if you want to really be seen to be accountable and engaging with the community. Well, would the, Geraldine, do you wish to speak to the motion? Okay. Um, look, I'm very happy to take that on. Yes, uh, sure, go ahead, Ron. Look, I think sometimes people don't know how to approach government, whether it's state, federal or local government. And I must admit that the number of times I've contacted the, the city of Vincent, you know, I've known who to write to, I've researched who's looking after that particular area, and I've got always got a comment back and I've always got a good service. Unfortunately, I haven't got all I want, but life's like that. And so my only suggestion would be that perhaps there can be some education process on actually how to approach local government and, and state government. And part of that is just knowing who to contact, find their email, and all those things are available online. And every time I've researched this and wanted to do something, I send an email, um, I've got a response. Um, so uh, I think really some people are better doing it than others. It's not that the service is not available. So maybe there's some way you can make it uh, more evident of where you have to go to get the information. Thank you, Ron. Just in response to that, um, unlike federal and state government, my mobile phone number's on the website and I spend a lot of my time talking to residents at the shopping centre, at the local park, when I go walking my dog, uh, when I go to school. Um, I talk to residents all day, every day, and I live in my community where I work. So, um, um, you know, there is it every attempt by me personally to talk to as many residents as I can, and I do that on and off duty, like I'm not really off duty. Um, and so, uh, but this particular motion about advertising the AGM, I think that's something we could certainly do. Um, I think it has been difficult this time around. We were, we were sort of coming back to council. We've had a snap lockdown. Um, we have tried to condense the two meetings onto the one night to reduce the amount of contact time that we're having this week. We did look at having it on a Monday night. Um, these are things all very happy to consider and happy to promote this more and do see it as a very valuable part of the effectively the commencement of our council year. Um, so there's certainly um, no problem with supporting this um, event, having much more promotion. So I'm very happy to, to support that motion that's been put forward. Um, are there any further speakers on this motion? Okay, I'll put it, all those in favour? Fifteen. 
15.4, anyone against? No one against. Almost getting to the home straight. Um, I've got three more motions. The next two are actually on behalf of other people who couldn't make it, but I'm moving the motions. So the next one is that the electors, one, note that there is a mixture of uncertainty and scepticism within the community that the ranges, that the city's ranges check streets for adherence with parking rules on a regular or frequent basis. And two, request that the city's website display information which is updated on a weekly basis and which shows which streets or street segments have been checked for compliance with parking rules and that the information contain the street or street segment and the time or times of day that the street was checked. Is there a seconder for the motion? Seconded by Geraldine Box. Um, th there was a Nebworth Avenue resident who was going to move the motion and I was going to second it. He couldn't make the meeting because he's got another engagement. He could have made last week's but not this week's. And it's pretty, pretty simple. It, it came about a, from a discussion I had with him a few weeks ago when he said he never saw the ranges in his street. And I pointed out that we don't know if the ranges in the street, unless we're out up the front all the time. I've seen ranges in our street once in the last year. They could have been there 20 times. It's just the coincidence. It's also gonna become even harder when e-permits are fully implemented and the rangers just drive down the street rather than slowly walking down the street with a stick of chalk. Uh, the, the rangers are gonna be significantly more efficient and that's going to mean that you have a reduced chance of seeing them in the street. So the obvious solution to counter the argument that a lot of people have is for the city to publish the information on the web and do it in a timely manner. So anybody who complains about ranges not checking the streets can be directed to the web page and they can see uh, that where the ranges have been. And it isn't just an issue about this one resident. It, as councillors would know, you would get lots of complaints about the right, we never see the ranges, we never see the ranges. And in fact, if you look at tonight's briefing agenda concern, there's an item concerning e-permits and it shows on page 374 that 10 respondents to the e-permits survey, it was just a small survey, uh, asked for additional range of patrols. So I think it's just a simple solution which would demonstrate the community that the rangers are in fact check checking their streets and will diminish some of those complaints from the community. <coughs> Geraldine, do you wish to speak to the motion? Are there any further speakers on the motion? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Six. All those against? That's two against. So I declare that carried. The second last motion is that the city reinstate the former practice of displaying proposed amendments to council propose amendments in the council chamber pr prior to each council meeting and that the pro proposed amendments be placed on the city's website prior to the meeting where practicable. Is there a seconder for this motion? Seconded by Geraldine. Again, this motion was gonna be moved by Vern Garden and I was gonna second it on his behalf. Um, and it, was, it stems from experiences that Vern's had in the meeting and his observations. He's got up and spoken only at the end to find the mayor saying, thank you, Vern, but we have some amendments that address that. Uh, it's been a long time practi practice to place copies of the proposed amendments in the copies of agendas that were available in the public gallery when they were available. They were the colored sheets that were shoved in the, the front of the agendas. It enabled members of the public to be aware of what was contemplated by council and have a chance to address it in the public speaking time. The practice seems to have stopped when the agenda is no longer placed in the gallery. Um, and I think, that's, it, I think that was a step back. Apart from the also being placed in the gallery, they used to be placed on the city's website. Um, not all the times, but if you go and check the meetings of the 28th of July, 2015, 25th of August 2015 and others around that time period, you'll see the amendments were available to the community before the meeting so they could get up and address the amendments as well as, um, as what they were originally going to speak about. 
So I think it's a simple process. You could just have a pin-up board or that door there and just stick them up. So community members are aware of what may be coming up and they can say that's great or you're not going far enough or you're going too, too far. So um, I think I move it on behalf of them. Thank you. Geraldine, do you wish to speak to the motion? Are there any other speakers on the motion? Okay, I'll put it all those in favour. Nine. Nine, four, anyone against? No one against, thank you, that's carried. And the last motion is that the electors, that the electors won. Note that the signature block on emails sent by city employees contained the words engaging, accountable, making a difference. Two, note that the examples provided at the meeting of instances where transparency and accountability have diminished and where engagement has been poor. And three, request that the administration stop using the words engaging and accountable on their signature block until such time as they are. So a seconder for this motion. Seconded by Geraldine. Do you wish to speak to it, Geraldine? I haven't spoken to it yet. So as I mentioned, the signature block has engaging accountable making a difference. Um, and my observations are not consistent with this, and I'll give you some examples. There's about six or eight, I could go more. The first one is the annual budget. It used to have lots of detail, and you could see exactly what was proposed. It wasn't extra work for the um, staff. It was basically the, the budget that they had developed themselves. And the CEO at the time took the approach that there was nothing to hide, so why not publish the whole, whole budget? So there was a lot of detail. For, so for example, 2013-14 operating budget was 65 pages long. You could see every program, you could see how much was proposed. This was changed, I don't know when, 15-16, 2015 was 2016, so that you only then saw each section, and there were two figures basically, which was employee costs and other. You had no idea what the other was, you just could see what the, the sections were spending. So there was a lot of information that was, was lost. This year it's even worse. The budget consists of the minimum mandatory requirements. All the community can see is that in the area of recreation and culture, it's $18.8 million, there's no detail. In community amenities, it's $12.1 million, there's no detail. There's no further background, and I think that's, there's no transparency, and there's no way to hold people accountable. So that's the first. The section, second one is about advertising the budget. The town's consultation policy says the annual budget must be advertised for 14 days. This hasn't happened for a number of years. All that gets advertised is something about differential rates, which means nothing to most people, and especially years like last year when the GRB changed. So there's, the budget's no longer advertised for comment. The next example is names on reports that go to council. The practice until December 2019 was that the names and position of the author and authoriser would appear on all reports to council. That stopped in February 2020. When I asked why, I was told, and this is a quote, this is an internal administrative detail not relevant to council's decision-making process. The CEO is the authoriser of all reports going to council. That may be so, but the guidelines for agendas and minutes prepared by the Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries suggest that the minimum standard includes having the author's name and position on each report. I think that, that obviously makes staff more accountable and I think it also encourages pride in their work. Um, confidential attachments. At about the same time that authors' names disappeared from reports that were on items, uh, were on items in the, the agenda, there was an item about the lease of the DSR building. So both Ron and Nick would be uh, very familiar with that both being on opposite sides at the time. The report mentioned that an independent market valuation had been obtained and the lease value was about $640,000 per annum. The actual valuation report was confidential. After the lease was finalised, I asked if the valuation would be made public. The response I received was, and I'm quoting, the valuation report has commercial value to the valuer and therefore remains confidential in accordance with section 523 blah 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 of the Local Government Act, 1995. 
In respect to the market value, it's not a statutory requirement for the city to release the market value. And it's not the administration's view that it's in the public interest to release the market value. But we already know what the market value is. It's $640,000. It's what else was in that report. What we want to see is whether or not the city got a good deal or not. The next example is the tree selection tool. The community participated in a workshop about tree selection in Vincent. A tool was developed, which essentially was a spreadsheet of some sort, but it was never made public. A community member asked if it would be made public and the response was, no, the tree selection tool was developed as a tool for administrative use only and provides a guide for staff on tree selection based on various streetscape typologies within the city. There was a subsequent offer to make, uh, made for the staff to sit down with people to use the tool. But I think what the community wants to see is the parameters that were loaded into, tool, into the tool and whether or not their input was taken on board. The next example is councillor workshops. The council used to have uh, council forums. These were open to the public generally. In about 2016, these were replaced by council workshops. It's hard to know when because they were not made public and the, the dates were not made public. In 2020, the dates of the workshops were made public. The items that for discussion were not made public, but at least we knew the dates. And I've asked for the items and so I know what's, what was discussed. In 2021, the dates have not been made public. I'm not saying not have workshops. I just don't see why they all have to be secret. Um, I want to see which council, council members contribute and which do not. The next example is a long-term cycle network. The Department of Transport decided to develop a long-term cycle plan in the metro area in 2018. It was a two-year project developed in conjunction with local government. Local governments like Cottesloe developed a community engagement process and worked with the community to identify routes. Vincent did not. The first the community knew about it was when it was put on the council agenda just before the response was due to the Department of Transport. The plan was poor, and I think because they didn't consult with the community, and even had a path going straight through Hyde Park. The, the last example is that with commercial waste, there was no attempt to, to engage owners to see what might suit them. It was just presented as a fait accompli. I could go on, but I, but I won't. I think things used to be a lot more transparent in Vincent and it did a much better job at being accountable. I think the last five or six years, things have gone backwards and I don't think I'm alone. Geraldine, do you wish to speak to the motion? Okay, are there any further speakers on the motion? Uh, the motion is that uh, the, in effect that the administration is not engaging and accountable and that they should be removed from the email signature. Uh, so no further speakers. All right, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Nine, four, anyone against? Zero against. Well, that concludes the motions that I have um, in writing on the table before me. So I believe that um, unless anyone has any last minute um, additions, that has, has called general business to an end. And, sorry, just, where are we? So that concludes general business and item five is closure of the AGM. So I'd just like to thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you very much for masking up and um, registering and hand sanitizing. And um, we really appreciate your feedback and uh, your um, issues that you've brought forward and the way you've taken time to um, articulate them. Um, and I won't, um, I won't uh, preempt what administration's going to do, but we have had a reasonable amount of motion. So my best guess would be that we probably won't have a response until the March meeting, but are we able to confirm CO with, with the electors, um, the sort of time frame that we might be expecting, not necessarily right now, but um, sooner rather than later? After you, Nicole, yes, uh, I would have thought within the next two meeting cycles, we'd better get a full response to all those motions. Okay. All right, so thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Appreciate that. And um, I'll declare the AGM closed at 
48 p.m. Thank you.